events, as well as public awareness campaigns and educational programs. Sustainable Coastlines has worked with over 100,000 volunteers on tree planning and coastline cleanup events. He was instrumental in bringing together 144 organizations and many people for the construction of the flagship educational center in 2017, through which Sustainable Coastline actively educates New Zealanders on how to protect their local environments. The flagship received the World Energy Globe Award and sustainability-minded buildings. He has worked with differences on conservation projects and collaborated extensively with prisons to develop opportunity for future employment for former prisoners. He also was the founding chairperson of Pinui River Care guiding the charity which now employs 47 local ragata he Maori and plants more than a half a million native seedlings annually for restoration projects. He is now working to scale this model nationwide and hopefully worldwide. Mr. Judd was named New Zealander of the Year for the Environment in 2010 and Young New Zealander for Year 2013. Sustainable Coastlines was recognized with the Supreme Award at the 2013 by the New Zealand's Ministry of Environmental Green Awards. Over to you, Mr. Judd. Thank you, Dr. Dubek. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so hopefully you can now see uh, the slide here, which says Te Mahere Whakauka, uh, the HOPE project. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a traditional Te Reo Māori greeting. Uh, so whenever we do presentations here in Aotearoa, um, it's customary to do a bit of an introduction in the local Indigenous language. Um, I'll come back to why that's important later, but I've, I've put it into a translation so that you can understand what I'm saying. I'm not going to read it out in English. Ko rimu taka nā pai maunga, ko te awa kairangi te awa. Ko te whanganui atara te moana. Ko whainga roa te kainga i nga i anei. He whakamihi atu ki nga tipuna nei. A he whakamihi atu ki nga kui anei. He whakamihi atu ki nga kaumatua nei. A he whakamihi matihere ki nga kaitiaki o nga tangata o te ao tūroa nei. He whakamihi mai o hā ki nga kaitiaki o nga taio o te ao tūroa nei. Hari kua taku nā kou ki te haere mai ki te tautoko o te kaupapa o te rā. He hua taupuhipui o te moana me nga awa me te nā here a hau. Ko te mā here whakauka taku mahi kaupapa, ko he tautou mō te ahikā trust me Pūniu River Care me ko Waitangi te awa trust toku nā mahi whare. Ko Pākehā toku iwi, Ko Judd me Isaac toku nga hapu. Ko Sam a hau nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So, I will now start my presentation. Um, I started my journey in social and environmental entrepreneurship 12 years ago, <clears throat> where we started a, a charity called Sustainable Coastlines. Uh, that began for me with a love of the ocean. Uh, I'm a surfer, I'm a spear fisherman, and um, we're very lucky down, in, in, down here in New Zealand. Um, we have some beautiful coastlines and, and waters, and uh, this passion has taken me right across the Pacific Islands and, and, and around the world, um, traveling to go and, and enjoy nature. So 12 years ago in the Galapagos Islands, uh, we were out there on a surf trip, and we started finding uh, plastic in the ocean, which inspired us to start running large-scale coastal cleanup events and create this charity uh, that has now spread out really quite far across the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, the, the charity is all about enabling people to look after the waterways and coastlines that they love. Um, so that there is, was the mission statement. And the vision is for beautiful beaches, for healthy waters, 
and for inspired people. Now, this third part of the vision is really the most important part because it's people that have caused the problems for our coastlines and waterways. People have damaged them, but it's also people who fix those problems. So we've gone about focusing on people as the solution to these issues because the world would be better without a whole bunch of humans here, but we need to get it back to what we want. Now, I think uh, the, the, the one thing about the name Sustainable Coastlines, I'm not sure that we chose the right name. Like I've changed my thinking on that a little bit these days. Um, I'm no longer happy with the idea of sustaining what we've currently got because I'm not happy with what we've currently got when it looks like this or where, where it looks like this, which is from New Zealand, which we found ourselves. Um, I, I don't want to be aiming for something that is the current state of our environment. We need to regenerate our waterways. We need to regenerate our coastlines. It's a different definition. It's about making it better rather than sustaining what we've currently got. To begin with, we were worried about the animals that were eating plastic, that were getting caught up in plastic, and that was a, a big driver and a motivation for us to do all of this work. Um, some, some way into the journey, I, I, we researched it a lot, a lot further and realized that actually this was happening. Fish were eating plastic, thinking that it was food. Um, they're actually attracted to plastic because it has smell on it that, that attracts fish and birds to eat it. Now, plastic's made from the byproduct of the oil production process. It, it's a mixture of oil and chemicals, and some of those chemicals are, are really poisonous. There's carcinogenic chemicals in there. There's endocrine-disrupting chemicals in there, which can have a really, really bad impact on the way that our children are growing up. Now, I'm a, I'm a spear fisherman. You know, I go out there and I look for fish to shoot like this one and I'll go diving and I'll shoot a big fish like this. Now, this is a kingfish and it's quite high up in the food chain. Um, now, for that fish to get really big like that, it would have eaten a lot of smaller fish like this. So when you're hunting those bigger fish, they can end up having a high concentration of the chemicals that are being found in some of the smaller fish. It's a process called bioaccumulation. Now, when we realized that fish were eating plastic and that our food source was getting poisoned, um, it really motivated us to take this issue very, very seriously. Um, particularly for me, when I learned more about endocrine disrupting chemicals and what they can do to the way that children grow up. Um, when I had my baby daughter, this is her, Juliet, um, she's now nine years old. This is a photo when she was quite small, helping us plant some trees. Um, but I realized that if, if too many endocrine disrupting chemicals were to get into her body, uh, that it could make her go through puberty early and become infertile. So for me, I mean, one of my goals in life is to become a grandfather. And I would like to have grandkids that I can teach some of the stuff that I've learned. I'd like to be able to teach them to go fishing. Um, you know, I feed fish to my own daughter. So all of a sudden people dropping plastic was impacting my ability to become a grandfather. You know, that's a really cross cutting issue. It's not so much about saving the whales or the dolphins or hugging trees. You know, this is about the future of our families. You know, we found an angle that everyone cares about whether you're sitting in prison or whether you're sitting on the other side of the world right now, um, most people do care a lot about their, you know, their family legacy and being able to um, have, ha have grandchildren. So that message was we were able to cut that through and um, reach many, many more people once we learn more about it. The theme there is that we really learned a lot about the issue in the early days to really understand what was going on. And then we would deploy that to, to, to motivate people to take action. But that wasn't quite enough because just awareness is not enough. We need large scale implementation. To do that, we realized that we needed to prove the effectiveness of what we're doing. We needed professional evaluation. So we started by working out where this rubbish was coming from. Now in a, in a rural setting, you know, out in the farm lands, you know, a lot of the sources coming through the rivers and through the, the ditches on the side of the road. But in an urban setting, we need to start looking at these stormwater drains. So this is a photo of a drain in Auckland City. That's New Zealand's biggest city. Um, that one single drain 
That's what it looks like inside of there. Now, this is the most important street economically in all of New Zealand. We went down there pretending that we worked for the local council for the municipality, um, put on some high-vis vests and pulled all the rubbish out of the drains on Queen Street in Auckland with a pool scoop and, uh, and, and brought the media with us. So that one drain, this is the photo of what we found in that single drain, 167 pieces of plastic, which are the, the common thing about all of this stuff here is that it's, it's really single-use plastic. So we started to prove where it was coming from and then we combined that uh, with an education program that had an evaluation system attached to it that was able to prove behavioral change so we started to show by measuring the change with 17,000 school students doing a longitudinal study um, with professional psychologists that the education programs that we were running were reducing single-use plastic consumption and were reducing littering behavior and that was fundamental in our journey because once you know your intervention works it's easier to get it funded and it's easier to scale it up we already knew that that would happen if we got good results what we didn't know was how much interest people took in that and how it motivated our own staff because i tell you what like this kind of work picking up rubbish is it's hard work doing this in an NGO where you've got to raise the money to, to, to pay your team um, and also be running these, these, these type of events. So during my time at Sustainable Coastlines, um, some of these numbers were, were, were pulled out recently by Dr. Durback in the introduction, but over 100,000 people and more than 1.5 million litres of rubbish. Like To put that into, into context, um, the tallest building in all of New Zealand is made of concrete. It's the Sky Tower in Auckland City. It has 1.5 million litres of concrete in it. Now that is the tallest building in the whole country. And most of the rubbish that we're picking up is actually looking like this. It's, it's, it's really quite small stuff. So when you think about that in, in volume and litres, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge, huge amount. Um, but we realised that this is a global problem. And we also realised despite what we, you know i might have thought when i was a bit younger thinking that i could tackle the entire world and fix everything um there is plastic on every single piece of coastline in the whole world and there's no way that um, one ngo that started by a bunch of surfers in new zealand is going to fix all of that by themselves so then you have to decide well what are you going to do with the time that you've got you want to fix the problem but there's no way you're going to get to that scale where you're going to be able to do it all yourself um, so we decided to open source our work. We built a program called Love Your Coast, uh, which enabled us to take our knowledge and our evaluation frameworks and education programs and spread it throughout the Pacific, throughout Asia and throughout New Zealand as a capacity development program. So what that looked like was enabling people to look after the, the waterways and coastlines that they love. That's our mission statement. So for us, enabling people is building tools and then teaching people how to use those tools once they've been proven. Um, we started to address some of the most difficult places that you can possibly go um, because we figured that if you can do it in a place like Port Moresby, which is one of the most dangerous cities in the whole world, um, and you can make it work there, um, then you're gonna have a robust model that can be spread even further and go global. So this is an image of Port Moresby, of a, of near Ella Beach in, in Port Moresby. And when you look at this image, you can really see the level of despair that it can get to for a lot of places in the developing world. Um, Papua New Guinea, which is where this is from, is on the, you know, on the list of some of the least developed countries in the world. Um, less than 30% of the population even have electricity. And uh, this is an area where they're actually catching and, and eating fish. Um, it was too dangerous for us to go in there by hand. We had to actually get a digger to start to pull that rubbish out. Um, we motivated over 850 people in one day um, and spent a lot of work training up some of the local leaders here um, to learn how to run the Love Your Coast program, um, which they then started rolling out around the country in partnership with the Olympic Committee. <clears throat> and that was proven to actually work really, really effectively in places that we've never visited. Um, they've been receiving the education program and it's dramatically reduced the level of litter on their coastlines. 
um, that is also delivering skills that helps people to uh, learn how to be a confident speaker and to go and tackle other challenges in life. So we have seen that capacity develop mo development model uh, work effectively. But that's not the only way to reduce plastic going into the ocean, right? Like education's one part, uh, but you've got to look at infrastructure, you've got to look at policy, you've got to look at marketing campaigns. When you're do doing these interventions, you, you then need to be able to prove that it has actually reduced what's gone into the, into the ocean. So we realized that we needed a, a really good system for capturing that data. Like we've always done a lot of analysis on the rubbish that we've picked up. Um, but we realized that it wasn't very efficient and it wasn't able to go global. So we raised a bunch of money and developed a citizen science littered data and solutions platform. Um, that is called, it's, it's got an app uh, which people can use for free. And it, it's alongside the United Nations categories for plastic in the ocean. So we're one of the founding partners of the Global Partnership for Marine Litter and also the Global Partnership for Nutrient Management. So I'm going to get on to nutrient management in a in just a minute. Uh, that's litter intelligence right there. It's um, litterintelligence.org. So you can easily find that if you um, if you want to Google it and have a look at the tool that we developed. Um, that is now fully fully functional. Um, so at the point that we raised the money to build the litter intelligence tool, I shifted my personal focus into the the, the waterways space, uh, which is a program called Love Your Water. Um, sorry about the resolution on that slide, but basically when we went and saw those stormwater drains, we could see some, we could smell the problems that weren't quite as visible as plastic is. It's quite visible here when you look at a river that has got, stock have got access to it. Now this is quite a common sort of sight in New Zealand. Um, when heavy hooved animals are walking on the side of a riverbank like this, um, they are defecating into the river or their, their effluent is going into the river. Um, we also have fertilizer pouring into our rivers. And we also have um, breaking up of the land, which causes sedimentation. So this is the biggest river in New Zealand, Te Awa Waikato or the Waikato River. And you can see that plume of sediment that's pouring out. Um, out of that river mouth there. Now that's a very common site and a lot of rivers around the world, they should not be running that color. They should be running clear. Now when they're running that color, they cause major problems uh, for people and the environment. I, this is actually a surf break on the left side of the screen, right where that point is. I, I actually got sick surfing there one time and that really reinforced it for me of how important this issue was. A lot of our waterways that have too many nutrients in them, uh, what happens is we get these algal blooms. So that's a close-up shot of algae right there. It's obviously an aquatic plant. So that feeds off the, the nutrients that are pouring into the waterways and it clogs up the ecosystem. Now that causes major problems, um, especially with climate change because the, the algae grows faster, the hotter it is. Um, so when a whole bunch of algae pours out into a river mouth, uh, you can get a really, really bad situation called a dead zone, uh, where you get a lot of microorganisms that feed on the algae and then they die, they drop to the bottom of the ocean and they rot away. As they rot, they pull the oxygen out of the water. That makes it very, very difficult for fish and other species uh, to be able to survive in those conditions. So dead zones are becoming more and more prevalent around the world. Uh, we really hope that we don't start to see them here in, in New Zealand, although we've got about four of our major waterways are at high risk of becoming dead zones. Um, that, that's where you get this eutrophic situation and there is not enough oxygen in the, in, in the water uh, for species to survive. It, it ends up, you end up with a lot of species that can survive it, like jellyfish, and, um, and, and, and far fewer fish. So um, that causes major disruption, dis disruptions to ecosystems. But, you know, we can talk about these problems, but what are we actually gonna do about it? Well, we realized that planting trees next to waterways was something that people really, really like doing. Um, it's good for water quality and biodiversity and climate change and human health all in one. 
So when you plant trees next to riverbanks, I'll take you back to this slide here where you can see this riverbank that's got, that's just pasture, that's grass, that none of this is really native um, trees around here. The stock are right on the, on the, on the water bank. So that is pouring pollution into the river and you can see the color of the water is not very good. When you retire a section of land from the edge of the river back and put a fence up and then plant it with native seedlings like this, um, that is holding the riverbank together so it's reducing sedimentation. It also creates a buffer zone, it's called a riparian buffer zone where the trees and shrubs actually feed off the nutrients and eat those nutrients um, to stop them from going into the water. Uh, so it's reducing the amount of bacteria and the amount of nutrients going in there. You also are creating habitat for native biodiversity. So as long as you control the pests, and we have a quite a big issue with pests in New Zealand, um, then if you control the pests and you establish habitat like this, then you're creating places where native animals will make nests and survive and increase in their numbers. Um, you're also, of course, sequestering carbon by doing this. So it's an intervention that has multiple positive impacts for the environment. But what we also learned is that it actually has really good impacts for people as well. Um, you're out there, you're working, you're in nature, um, you're getting physical activity, and connection to nature is proven to be good for mental health, which is a key issue for for everyone and I can tell you you know I go out there planting trees I finish a day of that and I feel really good and so do all the school kids that have come with us also so do um, a whole bunch of other people that we work with like um, offenders now early in our journey we realized like there's no way we can scale this up by ourselves um, we need to be innovative we need to be creative we need to think of solutions to, to take this to scale so a long time ago, this is about seven years ago, this image, uh, you can see my face with the sunglasses on here. The rest of these guys who are around me working, you can't see their faces. There's a reason for that. It's because they're serving a sentence. They're offenders who have been served a community-based sentence. So I've delivered more than 250 days um, on conservation work with community-based offenders like these guys. Um, where I will run an educational presentation with them in the morning and then deploy them uh, to go and do work on conservation. At the start, we just did the work, which was a six hour work day. And then when I started running a presentation before we kicked off the work, um, we were able to, with one hour less in the work day, we were able to double the output that we were achieving because we were giving them something. We were educating them as well. Um, and they got passionate about it and they started to care about it. So we managed to connect with a section of society that is not normally looked at as a source of um, contribution towards positive conservation work. And what we also realized through this was it was healing people. It was helping to heal people who had major mental health issues, who had addiction issues, um, who had perhaps, you know, had a, an upbringing that wasn't quite as privileged as other people have had. Um, and they loved it and they got stuck in and we got huge amount of work done. So then I realized, well, actually, we also need a source of seedlings. Um, so I rang the local prison out of the phone book and um, managed to persuade them. Well, they were really keen. As soon as I presented the idea, we, we built a, a, a native tree nursery at a prison in central North Island in the Waikato. Now, this is a working prison with 650 men who work a dairy farm that surrounds the prison. Um, so they're spending all day working with cows. Now, 53% of the New Zealand prison population are Māori. That's the indigenous population. They only form 17% of the general population. Now, that is a shocking and embarrassing statistic, um, which unfortunately is the same situation if you're looking at First Nations people in Canada, in the United States, you have disproportionate imprisonment rates for minorities and for indigenous. Um, if you look over at Australia uh, with, the, with the Aborigine population over there, uh, the stats are, are, are similar, if not even worse. Now, it's not just about prisons, but it's also a lack of employment, uh, less opportunities in education, 
and um, much poorer health outcomes than non-Māori have in, in New Zealand. Um, so those are all statistics that I'm not very proud of, I'm not very happy about, but I want to do something about. And as we started to do this work, we realized that we actually could do something about it. So alongside building this nursery, this native tree nursery at the prison, um, we engaged with the local indigenous population. Um, the river that you saw in the previous slide there that runs through the prison right there, uh, that's a stream, that's a tributary of the Puniu River. So rivers, when I started my introduction in Te Reo Māori at the start, uh, the very first thing I said was, ko te awa kai rangi te awa. Um, so when you introduce yourself during a mihi whakatau or a traditional Māori introduction, you always start with, where, with, with your river. So I said, te awa kai rangi is the river. Um, the local Māori, where there's prisoners, would say, ko puniu te awa. The puniu is the river. So the local Māori who are from this area where the prison was, we started engaging with them. And um, I helped a young leader there to establish a charity called Puni River Care. These are their values. These are their own values. Um, five years ago, we set a, a target um, as to what, what we were going to try and achieve. And we're now in year five. And we have the capacity to do 1.5 million native seedlings. Now, 1.5 million native seedlings would mean a workforce of 110 people. And as soon as you're starting to get up to some big numbers like that, you're seeing some major social changes going on. Um, you're, you're talking about some of the staff or quite a significant number of the staff in this organization have come from a situation of unemployment, of deprivation, um, of unequal, unequal opportunity, unequal educational opportunities and now they're super proud and they're in there running a very very large nursery right next to their marae which is a, a traditional meeting house and they give us a really really strong strong story of success um, now when they asked me to chair this organization at the very start which is about five years ago i agreed to do it on the provision that i would not be there forever so my whole career, I've always focused on putting myself out of a job. So I did it for three and a half years, um, and then I passed that on. So this is a model, a proven model, that we're now taking nationwide across New Zealand um, and internationally is the goal. So the, the, the issue that we're addressing here is we know that this organization has seen improvements in health. We watched the staff uh, get, get fit, like lose weight and get fit and strong. We also watched them learn cultural competency and understand their own history as they were going through this work. Um, we watched them, some of them suffering from addiction problems. We watched them gain better mental health uh, through connecting to nature and through doing meaningful work, like work that was connected to their culture because the, the rivers, the mountains and the ocean in Te Reo Māori and Māori culture are fundamentally important. And that's actually the same with all indigenous cultures. They have a very strong connection to the land, much stronger than us foreigners who, well, my ancestors were foreigners who probably helped with the colonization of New Zealand. Um, we don't quite have the same connection. So it's not just about the negative statistics and trying to improve those. It's actually also about the fact that Indigenous people have a stronger connection to the environment than people who come from a colonization background, um, which is the main reason why I like to focus on that area. So as we're out there in these regions, though, creating jobs, it's not enough just to create a job. You know, you've got to have wraparound services. You've got to have um, counseling support you've got to have tools and how to how to do governance how to do human resources and budgeting and, and and finance and fundraising and all these different skills that are needed so that's what I do as a job is I build toolkits that I can help people to use uh, to run an effective organization this one now Puni River Care has 47 staff and is planning to scale up to 110 and they are now working on establishing housing out 
near the mud eye here in some of this land that you can see that's not yet a nursery. So we realized that actually construction and housing is a major important part of having a successful enterprise. And while I was still at Sustainable Coastlines, which I left last year uh, to run this HOPE project, which is scaling up the tree planting, the food production work, um, we built an education center on the waterfront in Auckland City. We had very, very little money to be able to put into this. Um, so we created a series of partnerships, including this one, which is the Maximum Security Prison in Auckland, where my role was um, motivating prisoners to go into vocational training, to do welding and joinery. Um, and this is a, a, an image of Maximum Security Prisoners. Uh, most of them are violent offenders, cutting up a shipping container uh, with a nine-inch angle grinder, which is an extremely dangerous piece of work to do, but it is actually what people need. They need skills so that they can depart from prison and go into employment. Now, that is proven to reduce reoffending, which is proven to save taxpayer funding. So if you can do that, if you can deliver for example, a whole bunch of native trees being produced like we did at the other prison um, and create horticulture qualifications for, for people who are serving a sentence. And then they get a job when they come out of prison and then they don't go back into prison. You can prove that if you have a big enough data set and um, that's going to save the taxpayer $100,000 a year in New Zealand, which gives you a sustainable financing mechanism that's not just good for continuing to plant trees, but it's making people's lives better. It's reducing grief, it's reducing crime, um, it's helping a, a core social area of society, um, which also is good for health, because the less crime we have, um, the less health problems you're going to have. And when you're, again, you know, what, one of the things I can tell you from having worked in eight different prisons is that it is not a very nice place to be, this place, these workshops. Um, you know, we're talking about working with violent offenders who have had a very, very difficult past, and it's not very good for your mental health sitting in a place like that. So there are connections between social problems, environmental problems, and, and health risks um, that can be brought together in a really simple thing like cutting up steel or making something out of wood or growing trees. So this is the flagship education center. Um, this is a traditional uh, Maori waka or canoe, uh, which we had in the middle of our event space uh, when they wanted to use it for some training. This is a, a, like a, a photo from a drone. Uh, this has been built according to the Living Building Challenge, so it's completely off-grid. It's got composting toilets, solar panels powering it, and it's made out of 85% salvaged materials, none of which are toxic. So there's no toxic materials in this building at all. It's the uh, most rigorous performance framework for construction on the planet. Um, so that means that we've been able to de develop a new construction methodology for building healthy houses um, using salvage materials and working with prison workshops. So we're now aligning the building of houses uh, with the jobs, planting trees and growing food. That way people have got a job in nature, healthy food, and a warm, dry house, uh, which are some of the fundamental pillars of well-being. Until you've got a warm, dry house, good work that you want to do, healthy food, and some kind of cultural or social connection, uh, those are the fundamental pillars of well-being. Once you've got those four cornerstones, um, then you can start to be innovative you can start to be creative. You can start to lead and teach other people um, on, on how they can deliver solutions. So uh, this is an image of our famous um, prime minister when we launched the education center. And um, it was mentioned in the introduction, but we received uh, what's described as the most prestigious youth award for sustainability on the planet for that work, which was really a reflection of all of the work that we have done with sustainable coastlines. But Coming into the end of this talk now, um, you know, the conclusion of all of this work, for me, um, I left Sustainable Coastlines, the charity I started myself last year, uh, to focus on rolling out this job creation model where we would be able to get a big enough data set to prove social impact was happening alongside environmental. 
So social impact includes, for example, reducing the health costs to taxpayers by creating jobs that are making people healthier. Because we know that it's happened. We've seen it happen. But the issue is you can't prove this with just 47 staff at Purnia River Care. You need thousands of data points to be able to prove something like a health improvement. Um, for example, to, to, to prove a reduction of recidivism, you need 200 people with convictions to get jobs. So we decided to look at scaling this model up, and that's what we're underway with right now. We have 38 multi-led enterprises all across New Zealand um, running nationwide, and they're all creating jobs, planting trees and growing food, and working towards a monitoring and evaluation system that we all use consistently uh, so that we can show that impact. And once we can prove that we've reduced recidivism and improved health at the same time as planting millions and millions of trees and cleaning up the environment and helping climate change, this model is going to roll out all across New Zealand and internationally because no one wants crime, no one wants health burden on their, on their tax bills, um, and everyone wants clean water and a cooler planet. So that's the goal of Te Mahere Whakauka. Within a few years, we'll be planning to share that model internationally. Now, we also know that for Māori, um, they want these jobs. They care about the natural environment uh, more than religion, more than spirituality even, and more than um, even using the, the, the Māori language. The health of the natural environment and looking after the environment are deeply important for Indigenous people. And it's, it's understandable why that would be the case. So we've now started rolling this out. We've, um, we've built several new organizations around the country like this one. We have innovative governance models that enable cultural representation to be in charge of controlling the organization, but a bespoke board to actually run it. Um, so these type of governance models enables the, the, the local cultural leaders to be in charge of who's on the board, but not actually be on the board because they're all too busy and some of them don't necessarily always have the skills that you need uh, to run an enterprise like this. So I often describe myself, people say, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm an enterprise design and an intervention design professional. So I help people build enterprises and build ways that they can create sustainable jobs out of them. Um, so this is called Waitangi Te Awa Trust. Um, Waitangi is, of course, the place where we signed the Treaty of Waitangi uh, between the, 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 the English and, and Māori. And this is events that we started running there um, last year, planting trees. We've started just deploying um, the, the model already. So this is a warm, dry, small emergency house that's being delivered to a place that has extremely high levels of deprivation in, in rural east coast of New Zealand. Um, what you'll find in New Zealand, yes, we are a developed country, but um, the people who are below the poverty line here um, suffer greatly because it's really expensive to live in New Zealand. Um, so we do have conditions that I would describe as um, well below that level of development. So we're combining the intervention. I'm going to finish up in the next couple of minutes. Um, we're combining the intervention, jobs, planting trees, uh, jobs, building houses for the, the workers to live in, and, um, and jobs, growing organic food so that the families all around those enterprises are all fed with culturally appropriate food like this beautiful sweet potato or kumara, which is a traditional uh, Maori food. Now we're also looking into value add infrastructure. So that's uh, things like manuka honey and essential oils and natural dyes where you can make garments out of the materials that you're growing um, when you're planting the trees. Um, so that's a, a woolen blanket that's made out of flowers, pahutakawa flowers that, that, that we made as an oh, example of, of how you can um, Mr. use Jack. the native... Thank you. We really need to, can you finish because we really need to leave some time for questions. Yep. So this is my very last slide. Um, so um, look, thanks very much for joining everyone. Um, I've got a list here, which I'll, I, I think we're going to go.
we're going to go off onto the onto the questions now. And I'll, do, do you want me to stop the slide? Yes, please. Okay. Well, we can share this maybe later. Um, this list of different areas of work that we're doing. Um, those are my contact details. And now we'll just um, we'll just shift over to any questions. Thank you. Uh, it was a very fascinating presentation. I'm sure that you could have continued and we could have continued listening. But unfortunately, this is a 60 minute program. So we really need to continue. Ariel, over to you with the questions. Thank you, Dr. Jarbeck. Um, so the first question is, what do you see as a compromise between the health of the planet and the economic well-being of the world? This includes tourism and large-scale factories, which are harmful to the seas and coastlines. Is such a balance po possible in theory? Yeah, it's, that's, that's a really good question. I think um, a, a lot of people get caught up in the idea that um, regenerating the environment is at the expense of economic development. I mean, that's a major issue here in New Zealand when you've got um, some farming practices here um, are very much not sustainable and cer certainly not regenerative. Um, so we have a real tension with that question. But a lot of the time, what I've noticed, um, and you know, I've taken this work to 17 different countries. I've been to about six different United Nations conferences and seen many different solutions that do actually work. You can have a regenerative business. A lot of the time, it's just people just don't have access to the knowledge of how to do that. Um, you can do that, for example, through offsets. So every time you take a, a boat and burn some fuel to go out surfing, and admittedly, I still do that myself. Um, if you're planting a tree as part of that business model, then you can have a regenerative impact as a business. And you know what? People actually want to give something back. So I don't think that um, I think that it's a short-sighted view to think that regenerative practices at the expense of economic development, if you look at it with a slightly longer term vision, um, without natural capital, we have no long-term econ economic growth. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Our next question is from Jessica Williamson. Yes, okay. um, uh, Sam, you spoke about the importance of indigenous values uh, for nature and for the work that you do. Could you give some more examples of uh, different values or, or knowledge that you've been able to incorporate from Maori into your work and into your projects? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, a big uh, 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 some of the really important values that 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 we've seen with working with indigenous communities with Maori communities here, there's a very strong theme or um, value called kaitiaki tanga. Uh, so that means guardianship. So if you're a kaitiaki, then you're a guardian. And um, once uh, local Maori get the opportunity to say, "Yes, I'm a kaitiaki of this river." Um, they're far more motivated than than people would otherwise be to look after that river. So, you know, because it fits in with their with a strong cultural value, um, they work harder to care about that river than someone who's just getting paid whatever that money is to go and and do the work. So, um, kaitiaki tanga has been a big one um, for knowing the tanga. So you know, strategic relationships and empowering families. There's a very strong kind of um, connection to whakapapa and family and family history with, with Indigenous peoples. Um, and that has meant that traditional knowledge that is held with some of the elders um, gets, I guess, harvested and saved or protected by people who are doing this work. And they'll go and they'll go and sit down with their with their aunties and uncles and grandparents and um, learn about what the river used to be like and how they used to harvest food from it and, and how they used to protect it. Um, and what's been really beautiful is because a, a, a lot of that knowledge is getting lost um, through colonization, through urbanization. Um, but as we're creating jobs in the regions, we're starting to see that knowledge come back and be deployed into, into practice. 
Uh, like another one that I think is really cool um, is Koha. So that's another Māori value. And Koha is about um, generosity. So it's about giving away your knowledge, about giving away, um, about helping people and inviting people to your place and feeding them really well. Um, so that idea of Koha fits in really well with something that I've been focused on for at least 10 years, which is open sourcing everything that we create um so we you know that that really resonates really really nicely with me um we don't just open source stuff we create it we prove it and then we raise funds to teach people how to use it which is going a bit further um down the track than open source you know you, you don't just fix a problem by just building an app alone you need to go and help people use it so yes i would say generosity um guardianship and um and strong family fucker papa connections would be three that stand out for me. Thanks. Ariel, next question. The next question is: Is there discrimination in hiring Indigenous people in European countries? Absolutely. Um, in New Zealand, there is. Um, I, I can't talk on behalf of of the, the whole world because you know my focus is here at the moment but the the unemployment statistics and uh, are very clear they're disproportionate um but it, it's it's worse than that you know in, in terms of people were even getting hired and their pay rates for for people who have an equivalent level of education um they're disproportionate and quite frankly um the, the stats are very clear you know in all countries that have been colonized, we have institutional racism within the policing system, um, within employment and business. Um, so there's, there's no doubt that it exists. Discrimination exists. Uh, you know, even people who are Maori but have a, a name that's not Maori find it easier to get a job than someone who's got a name uh, which is a Maori name. And that's quite frankly disgusting. So, you know, I'm very passionate about delivering interventions that start to rebalance that that story. Thank you. The next question that I have is, how do you encourage as many people as possible to such a socially important cause? Well, look, everyone's got different reasons for their motivation. Um, so I, I, I sort of talked about a, a couple of them in my journey. Like it, for me, it started with just wanting to care about the ocean. Um, then I started, you know, I cared about the animals, um, but not everyone cares about animals, you know. Then I started to find out more about the human health impacts of, of fish eating plastic, and that really drove me really, really hard. Um, sometimes it, it requires like a negative personal experience like if you stand on a broken bottle when you're going for a swim on the beach you'll never drop rubbish again right <laughs> if you if you get sick when you're surfing like my story um that's going to motivate you more but um everyone's got different reasons for caring um you know planting trees has so many positive impacts and i, I i've already read them out so i'm not going to go back to that but some people really like birds some people like surfing some people like catching eels um, out of the river um, and some people are extremely passionate about climate change and and then others just care more about health and human health and cultural impact but if you can bring all of those into one intervention that's not too complex like to be to be honest like growing food and planting trees is that's not that difficult to do <laughs> you know evaluation frameworks like what I'm working on where you're bringing that all together and doing the research that's a little bit more complex but the intervention itself is really quite simple it just has multiple areas that motivate different areas like different demographics of society um so it's it's th you know i always say um put yourself in the other person's shoes when you're thinking about how to motivate people from different uh demographics regions think about them rather than yourself for a while and then you'll work out a way to motivate them ariel <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, how has the ban on plastic straws helped pollution? Or has it helped reduce an immense amount of pollution in the ocean thus far? Um, look, the straight up answer globally, no. 
um, that's not going to be enough. The the vast majority of microplastics in the ocean are coming from synthetic fibers. So every time you you've got a plastic piece of clothing um, that you put it in the washing machine, thousands of pieces of plastic go into the ocean. So just straws or plastic bags alone is not going to do it. Um, we need much more robust legislation as well as education, as well as infrastructure um, to all be delivered. And just banning one thing alone, it does help. It's, it's definitely better than not doing it. But the volume of plastic going into the ocean is going up and up every year because there's more consumption every year, uh, particularly in developing countries. Uh, we need to think a lot more about how we would enable developing countries in particular uh, to improve their infrastructure and start removing plastic before it escapes. Um, that would be the biggest intervention I think we could possibly do. Like if you remember that photo from Papua New Guinea, you can see how much of a problem it is in a place like that. Straws are insignificant compared to that pile, you know? Thank you so much. Um, the next question that we have is, as we know, stressing or destroying vital ecosystems will have enormous economic as well as environmental and social costs. Which jobs are no harm for ecosystems nowadays? Which jobs are no harm for ecosystems? Was that was that the question? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that, that's a really good question. So. Look, I think our focus has been on regenerative jobs. So, you know, jobs where you're actually helping the planet um, when you go and do them. Now, there's a vast, you know, there's a whole bunch of different types of work out there. Um, so I, I can't really describe like all of the different jobs that are going to be um, negative or, or, or positive for the planet. But I think, you know, Education is one which is clearly important um, as long as you know that it's working. Like not all education programs work. So unless you're evaluating and proving the effectiveness of your education program, then it's, 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 you, you can't yet say that that's doing anything necessarily that's, that, that, that's, that's changing the situation. You know, I, I, I think... Um, Anywhere where you can contribute to something that can be scaled up, that can regenerate re regenerate the environment and regenerate people's health. Um, there's multiple facets of work that we're working on. You know, there's probably 60 or 70 different specialist fields within the, 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 the project that we're doing when it comes to building monitoring and evaluation tools. Um, for example, citizen science tools doing water quality or biodiversity or social impact research. Um, so... I think for anyone out there who's trying to think about what kind of job they want to do, they should think about their own personal values um, and what they like doing because they're more likely to stick at it if they have fun when they're doing it. Um, make sure that if regeneration is one of your values, then make sure it's a job that's doing that. Thank you. Um, very briefly, I'm sorry, I'm getting multiple different messages. Um, Jessica, I know that you had a question um, very quickly. Ariel, uh, thank you. Just lo look at your questions. There are a couple of things that I wanted to mention. I think that your focus on history of colonization uh, is excellent, besides many other things that you mentioned. But I think that this is basically and unfortunately foster discrimination and destruction of both the flora, the flora, the fauna, our environment, and particularly due to more consumption and our focus on buying more stuff rather than utilizing. Uh, I always use uh, an example. I have a blender that I received when I first got married. That was many, many years ago. Now, if you buy anything within a couple of years, uh, it destroyed. Uh, my parents' home and villa was made of huge blocks of stone. 
uh, now you can literally kick through the uh, separation between one bedroom and another, where all it's planned obsolescence. And I think that this is a very, very important problem that unfortunately is not addressed at all uh, because of the pressure with the manufacturers. Uh, so I would like your point on that. Yeah, I mean, I've been through the, the same issue recently with a phone, you know, it's, it's lasted less than a year, it was a very expensive phone, um, phones are full of toxic materials, heavy metals, rare earth minerals, um, we've changed our way of engineering to make money, um, we've also changed the way that we live and work to make money, um, with a short term focus, like New Zealand, right now could feed 40 million people, we've got a population of 5 million, we feed 40 million people a year, but most of that is actually dried milk solids that are not high value, um, they're not regenerative, and it's all focused on money making. In the, in the meantime, we've got, you know, 200,000 people suffering from material hardship, child poverty, who are not getting proper nutrition. Um, we've got lots of land, and we've got the ability to grow our own food. So I'm really about that, that sort of self resilience, you know, rather than worrying about what the global market says or what all the marketing says, you know, go, go there and learn your own, your own skills, you know, create a, an off the grid um, village where it doesn't matter if there's an earthquake because you've got simple, a simple wastewater system and you've got your own food right there. And if you get cut off from supplies, you're resilient because you're looking after yourself. Um, so I think less focus on, you know, what, what the marketing tells you that you need and more focus on core, core needs. Like I talked about the four cornerstones of well-being earlier, and I really do believe in that, you know, shelter, food, work, and, and social connections. And then, you know, that can all be reflected in a resilient person and a resilient enterprise that's not so reliant on, um, on the globalized markets and the way that we're fed all of this materialistic rubbish. The other question, I completely agree with you and I'm very glad that you pointed that out. The other question is, have you considered the fact that one of our biggest problems is also overpopulation? For the last, uh, since 1960s, we've been adding 1 billion people a year to our planet every 10 years. And nobody, that's another question and point that nobody is, well, it's addressed very, very little. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess I do, you know, it's a, it's something that we we don't really suffer from in New Zealand. We've got a very large country, um, but we're terrible in terms of how how much we consume. So we're per capita the tenth worst in the world um, in terms of how much we consume. We're we're probably similar with regards to emissions per capita. So we're actually really quite high in that regard. Um, but we still don't have a very big population compared to how much land we've got. Um, so it's not as um, prevalent when you're here. I, I mean, I, I've traveled in Taiwan and Singapore and places that are very densely populated. Um, and I, I think, you know, there is, a, there is a story about sustainable development within this as well. As, popula as populations become more developed, they rely less on subsistence agriculture. And then they start to have less children because, you know, in a lot of developing countries, they have lots of children because they need people to, 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 to work the land. I mean... This is the one thing I do know from like the discussion that I had about wanting to have grandchildren, for example, is whilst it's pretty easy to persuade people that crime is bad and, and polluted water is bad and plastic in the ocean is bad um, and negative health costs are bad, it's very difficult to try and persuade people that they shouldn't have kids. <laughs> like it's a very controversial topic to try and bring up. So, you know, I do see that as being an issue. However, thinking about the way that we use our land, um, we could sustain a much bigger population than we currently are in New Zealand. I mentioned that already. We feed 40 million people and we're not even that efficient. So we could well, get more efficient and more clever and we will 
we just need to spread that knowledge without it being such a focus on IP and making money out of it. I completely agree with you, and I'm most grateful for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, I do hope that you will continue with all your projects and that they will be as successful as they have been so far. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and Ariel, thank you for moderating. And Jessica, thank you for your questions. Have a very good week. And uh, as we mentioned, in our webinar, we are going to be taking the time off uh, for August, and we shall see you in September. Bye-bye.